Which one are we gonna yeah, so see we got a, a split lesson, I call a split lesson this one, well split scripture anyway. Um, on uh, uh, Paul's got it to Thessalonica, and then uh, John's having a second epistle to the church, of the, to the church of some origin, to the unknown lady. Uh, some people say it's an actual lady. Some say it's the name for the church. I'm not sure which one it is. I don't really know. I don't think it really matters, except for the fact that we have a letter to the unknown lady. But we know what the message is anyway. When he's telling the, un the, un the unknown lady and her, and her children. It's, well, we are, and we all assume it's, it's the church. But at any rate, uh, Uh, we, we'll do a, a couple of readings. Then we're going to. I, I want to read uh, 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 Romans 13 from the Heidelberg Catechism, but I want to do that later on. We get the Judge portion. Uh, so the first we we'll start out with just do a few verses from Psalms uh, uh, 47, 15, and Psalms uh, 19:3 uh, for the first portion of the lesson, because. Uh, if, if you look at uh, both passages, well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, because the topic and the issues being dealt with are quite different in, in Paul's letter as in John's letter. Because the issue of dealing with John's letter has to do with the return of Christ, the, sec the second coming, the thing we call eschatology. And the thing to do with, with, with in John's letter, that was Paul's letter, we were talking about, to, 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 not to Ephesus, but to Thessalonica. Uh, which is the second letter, which was written very shortly after he had re written the first one because people wouldn't, 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 were, were, had questions and were confused about, they thought they had been left behind, you know. And then, but for John's letter to the people that, to, from Ephesus to the Church of the Unknown Lady, it was about false teachings. And we'll get into that because that's where I want to spend the book of my time because I think that's the meat of it. For me, that will be the emphasis that I want to take is John's letter. Is the, because it has to do with Christology, the issue of who Christ is and his purpose. Uh, and, I, and I think that's very important because of most of John's writing, his epistle and his gospel, is that you might know him, it, that he may declare who the Christ is. And so obviously, down there, there at the church of the Bible, the lady, there was some false teaching going around by the Docetists that, that Christ was not a real person. He was not a real natural person. He was only appeared to be a person, only a, seemed to be a person. It was really a spiritual being that had uh, some kind of manifestation that wasn't a real person. So basically we know that the Trinity ascribes to the fact that God was fully God and fully man. So this is a grave era that's being that's, that's floating around now down there at, 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 at that church. That, uh, her, that that she had been, she not judgment, had been not listened to, but were holding up against that false teaching. But anyway, let's go to the first reading. <coughs> I do it, let's do our first one, Psalms 19.3. Psalms 19.3 read, there is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Nature speaks out, as well as mankind. Mm. Even when we don't, nature does. Mm. The whole of creation exposes, expounds, proclaims God's glory. Let's look at Psalms 147, verse 15. And, and the emphasis on these verses I want you to pick up is, is the importance and the prominence and the centerpiece of God's word. Verse 47, 15 reads, he sends out his command to the earth and his word runs swiftly. As a matter of fact, that passage there, you'll see that Paul picks that up later on when he talks about the word that runs swiftly. 
and he was related to the this one at, at this one, Lanika. And he said, uh, "Run swiftly." Then that's it. Okay. Now let's go to Second Thessalonians. Top of verse and read down to verse five. Uh, I'm going to go any further than that. Uh, notice, I, notice how Paul starts this out in his third chapter. He says, "Following, following what?" You, you know, one of the one of the Paul one of the thing that Paul does most of his writings is that he typically before he, before he gets into what, what, what we call Exhortation for application. He usually gives and goes into into the doctrinal or theological importance of what it is that he the doctrine itself. Because after all, what he's doing is carrying on these apostolic tradition, the which is the doctrines of Jesus Christ, of, of the teachings of Jesus Christ, and 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 that that that's so important. The teaching, the teaching, the teaching to the Jews and and even to their apostles, what they call the Didache. The teachings are most important because it's the teachings that everything is founded on. It's the, found, it's the foundation for everything. All the application, all the things of all the doctrines that you talk about and how they play out in your life and how you live them out in your life and how they encourage you to look forward to the final consummation is about the teachings, the, 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 the doctrine. So he's saying now having said because uh, having a uh, Having dealt with the issues of people uh, doubting that they had missed out on something, missed out on the of the return of Christ, because they were changing their behavior, people were changing their behavior because they thought that, like many of us, even thought probably when we first became Christians, and many people throughout the ages, over and off and on through history, have taught the imminent return of Jesus Christ to, <clears throat> to come back for the church. And so he, these people thought, that, well, we don't miss that. Kind of way. I thought I had to set them straight through his first letter. Then he sent the second letter to, to, by Timothy. I think it's Timothy. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sure it was different. I forgot it was from Timothy. But one of his, one of his uh, 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 sidekicks, one of his, uh, uh, he called uh, proteges, you know, uh, to, to deliver the second message. And he this is this this message is really about enduring trials in light of the return of Jesus Christ, and he's telling me you need to you need to stand firm and you need to need to he needs to set them straight in the, how you endure. And sometimes when you when you're waiting for something, look for something. If you don't know how to endure, if you don't know the formula, if you don't know the rules, if you don't know the rules of the game, uh, what it is that you're looking forward to, you'll you'll, you'll freak out, you'll lose faith. And so what Paul does in this letter. In these first five verses, he does three things. He talks about a, a prayer, confidence, and he then gives them a blessing. But when he in these five verses, what you're going to see in these five verses, one through five, he, he gives three things. He gives them a prayer, which is, which is two parts. He what tells the them, huh? What's the last thing? Say prayer, confidence, uh, 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 benediction, or blessings. Okay. <laughs> And then later on, he talks about their confidence. He gives them, he gives them two things. Each one of these things he talks about, he gives them to a couple. He gives them two major points. He gives them about being uh, about our prayer, confidence, and then the blessings that come with it. And both of them have two parts too. Let's look at it real quick. <clears throat> he says, "Finally, brethren, brothers, pray for us that the word." Of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that you may be delivered from the wicked and evil men for not all have faith but the Lord is faithful he will establish you and guard you against the evil one and we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God in the steadfastness of Christ. So 
in that city. In those five verses, he's given three major points with two couples, each one of them. He says, pray, first of all, he says, pray for him. And pray that you would have strength to endure. He says, and pray that you that you would be honored the word of God, that the word of God would be honored. In other words, he's saying, I'm not, he, and this is just this funny, this is so much like Paul. He, Paul was saying, I'm not so concerned about me as I am about the word of God advancing. He wants other souls to be saved. He wants enlightenment to come to people that's in darkness. He says, pray for the, the word of God that may, may be, may, and this, he, and, uh, you see that word where he used right here? He's quoting Psalm 147. Mm -hmm. That the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. He's saying two things. Let it, let, let it, let it go forth. Let it be pro proclaimed. Share it. Pass it along. And that it may be honored. So pray for me that I have strength to do that, that I'm able to do that. Not so much that I, for my welfare, because he's been, he's, as you know, as a matter of fact, he left just the ninth time. He left there pretty uh, hastily in, 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 in Acts 9, if I remember correctly. Uh, he didn't leave there with, 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 uh, with, 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 with a good feeling. Uh, so he's sending this back. So he's saying to them, don't so much pray for me, but pray that I'm able to execute, to carry out God's word, that souls might be saved. Look what he's talking about. And then he says, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. He knows that if people hinder his progress, if people incarcerate him, if people beat him up, if people do whatever, stop him, he can't go from city to city, synagogue to synagogue, meet him place to meet him place to teach the word of God and have us do the same. He's saying, so be praying for their, for the protection that God would enable him, it be, that he would remove the obstacles, rather, should I say, that he'd be able to progress, to advance this word of God. Then it says in verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He said, but God is faithful. See, he know he, he, he listened to this problem. He said, but I know God's faithful. Because mm -hmm. remember, that, and we have to be recently, God, he said, repeat over again, be not afraid. I'm faithful. I'll be with you no matter. I'll always be with you. Be, be courageous. Be strong. Paul's, remember, Paul's taking this and knowing himself, that he knows that if he has confidence and courage in God, God is faithful. Mm -hmm. He says, he will, that he will establish and that he would guard these two things. His confidence is that God will establish and that he would guard, not only establish, protect against the evil one. That's, that's right, the evil one. The, evil, the, 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 the word, if you look in, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, and deliver us from the evil one. That word in Greek is paneros, not paneron. Paneron means evil. But Paneros is the one identified, the, the Paneros, R-S, is the evil one, meaning the devil and his minions. He said that, that God would deliver them against the evil one, against the devil who's putting obstacles in the way from blocking the word of God advancing to people to know the truth. Because remember now, these people are faltering because they, they think they've been abandoned. And as you see, he, as it deals with it on this chapter, which we didn't cover, is that they have become so slack that they're thinking, well, uh, well, if he's coming, he ain't came. I don't sell, I don't give my house away. I don't sell my food. I'm now I'm begging off Sister, Sister Harris here, and she's getting tired of me begging off of her. And Paul has to even address that issue. So he says, and we have confidence in the Lord. Confidence that you are doing the will. I'm sorry, that you are doing the will, that you are doing rather. And we'll do the things that we command. He says, I'm planning to, God, I said, I, it's not praying. He said, I have confidence that you will execute, you will carry out the things that God has commanded. That you will, in other words, that you'll be obedient. He said, I have confidence in that. I have confidence that you'll be obedient. And, and, it said, and, and carry out to do the will of the Lord. That he has a he puts in you to will and to do his good will. He's saying that he that's what he's praying for. May have not this notion thing. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God. See, he said this is a benediction here. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God 
and to the steadfastness of Christ. He's saying, as I always used to say, is your connectedness in Christ, your ability to do these things, your ability to carry out, your ability to persevere, your ability to have confidence is not in yourself, but is in your steadfastness and connectedness to Christ through God. It is through God that, that, that we find the will to do and to endure. He said, Christ endured in your behalf, and because he endured, you can endure. He said, I'm directing you to be, think on these things, to think on Christ, and put him first, put him in perspective, that he endured for you to be able to carry on and pass his word of truth along to others that they might be saved. Very truly speaking, he knew. And this is an exhortation to, to them. In a, lot of, in a lot of the, he said, in a lot of, I told you, my exhortation to you now is, put it into practice. You have the example in Christ. I'm a, I mean, like I said, he's a, he was a living example for them. He, experientially speaking, he's going through these things. He said, but, but, more, but the most important thing is for the advance of the word of God is to be obedient to the word, realizing that to battle, as we say, is not ours, it's been won already by Christ. He said, because Christ endured, because Christ has won the battle, we can in Christ. That's the thing with union with Christ. Union with Christ is a, a, sometimes it's explicitly sometimes it's explicitly stated in his writings, and many times it's implied. Paul's writings is filled with union with Christ, because without Christ you don't have anything. Without Christ, your work is totally in vain. Okay, so he's so he's telling them at the Sonica. The second coming hadn't come yet. Get busy. Advance the word. There are souls to be saved. Mm -hmm. There are souls to be saved. You need to, you need to get off your tusks and get moving in the community. Go to the synagogue. Share the word with your brother. You know, uh, share the word with the enemy. Because that's what's important. Let's go to uh, second epistle of John. Also, brother, he wanted to be patient, or be so hasty. Right, that's true. As a matter of fact, as he uses, is it him or as a John? One of them uses the word about, about patience in in, in one, one fast. The very patience, hupomone, is that to endure. It's to what they, that's what the word endure means. Patience It's to endure the hardship. Okay. It's because what he's saying, you will have hardships in this, in this on this journey, but you get to endure in light of the fact that Christ will return. See, they're thinking, we've been doing it, he don't pass us by. He said, no, he ain't come back yet. Get, get off your toes. Get busy. There's some more work to be doing, to be done. Okay. You have to endure the good fight. You have to endure the task that's before you, and then the end will come. Maybe not in your lifetime, but the end will come. Patience yeah. Get too hasty. Right, get too hasty. Get, exactly. Get blessing, too. Exactly. Right, exactly. So that's what, that's what he's saying about, about, about being patient. Being patient in line with the fact that he has not returned, and he has returned for a good reason, because it's work for you to do. There are souls to be saved. Okay? And that's why he expresses the importance, and I, and I use this all the time, this, this is why it's so important. The word is so pivotal. The word, the word, the word. And because what he's saying here is in do the truth and pass the word of truth alone. It, take that, because it's, it's the word that saves. It's the word that enlightens. It's the word that gets us out of the dungeon. So let's, let's go to uh, Second John. The epistle. Third chapter. Second John four. Four, the fourth verse. Oh, you know I was Second John. You might want to start at one. I don't Let me know. hold something. I'm lost here. Let me. Second John has one chapter. Yeah, it does. It does. I'm thinking about something. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say the wrong thing? <laughs> I can't get to the wrong thing. Hold on. <laughs> Go back. Let me read it then. Second John. Okay. You know what? I messed up on that one. But no, I did. No, I did. No, I did. No, I did. Okay. 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 
the only reason I'm hmm, I'm thinking that. Uh, that's the reason I'm thinking it was the second chapter. Mm -hmm. Okay, and at any rate, let's go to the very top of the very top of the lesson of the of the of the other letter itself. As a matter of fact, this is one chapter. We, we, we can read that whole chapter. <clears throat> the elder, that is John. He's the elder. And, and as a matter of fact, according to historians, John is probably this letter, the second epistle, is written when he was much older. Uh, well, I'm gonna get, let me get, let me get to that. You know, it's it's typically thought that Revelation was written 90 A.D. That's what most people believe that, and most people teach that. But when you when you when you when you put side by side John's epistles and the dating of his epistles, these epistles and Revelation, it makes you wonder if it really were written there. I personally don't believe it's written before ninety, but I mean post ninety. I think it's written prior to the fall of Jerusalem, and there's a lot of reasons why I think that we can get to that. But John wrote this letter from Ephesus because he became the pastor or the leader there at Ephesus. And, 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 and he had, and, and like most of, of these letters, the epistles, they were supposed to be circ circular, we call a circular letter. They were to be transferred from church to church to exhort the people and to encourage them to endure the hardships because whenever you teach a doctrine or lay a foundation, there are always those that come behind you to unshovel it, to un thoroughly, to, to distort it, and to teach false doctrine. So what's going on here is that when John writes this letter to the, to, the, to the elect and the lady in this church, he's writing to attack the issue of what we now call the deity of Christ in the sense that he was fully God and fully man. Because there was a group of people called the Docetists, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-T, -E -E something like that, the Docetics. The Docetics taught, and the reason we need the word Docetic because it comes from the, word, the Greek word dokain. Dokain means to appear or to seem something. That's the Greek word dokain. They said, because remember now, the Greeks taught that matter, which is the flesh, of physical material things, matter was what? Evil. And God can't have matter because otherwise they would contaminate God. God would become evil. God is a So for them, God had to be totally spiritual. Nothing physical. No material. If he was material, wrong. He's evil. It's not pure. Because the flesh was considered to be frail. So they told that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Remember now, and from the very beginning, that was always the, 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 the message of the Proto-Evangelion, Evangelion, was that he, the seed, will come and deliver man in the flesh. That was always throughout, before, before the Greeks got on, on board, even back from the very beginning, that a Savior would come. That was always God's plan of redemption, that he would send a God-man. And to this listen to the question as to why the God-man. And it's a whole book written by a guy named uh, Saint, 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 Saint Anselm by Why the God Man. It is so important, and this is the same issue he addressed, that's the issue he addresses in his book that's coming from John, second epistle, is about the nature of who Christ is. He was not only God, eternal, spiritually, but he was God naturally in the flesh. He came and tabernacled in the flesh, in the physicality among us. And the Greeks people, and the Greeks said, they don't believe that that's not a God. So this group of people called the Docetists taught that we know that he didn't come in, in the flesh for real. It only appeared they did. And this teaching was being spread down at this church of, where the elect, the elect lady and her children were. But they held out because they held true to the teachings of the apostle himself, who was there and know for a fact that Jesus was not only appeared to be in the flesh, but was actually in the flesh, because I sat at his breast at the table. I walked with him, I talked with him, I ate with him, I slept with him, I know he was the man, as well as God. 
So this is what God, this, this is the issue that John is addressing, and we call this Christology. Christology is so important because when you distort who Christ is, you distort, you distort his deity. And when you distort the deity of Christ, other than the biblical, you don't have Christ. And if you don't have Christ, you don't have a Savior. If you don't have a Savior, you don't have salvation. It destroys, it destroys the message of the gospel. So if Christology is so important that you keep Christ as a biblical Christ intact. So this is what he's addressing here with these people at the, down here at this, at this church. And the reason, and the reason that I mentioned to you earlier about this is, 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 uh, just like his other letter, the Revelation, his letters, because the docetics came on the scene really right at the, at, at, at the, at the crux of around 90 and later and became really, really big. And as a matter of fact, this is an issue, believe it or not, this is an issue really that the Jewishes have. This is an issue that the Mormons have. This is an issue a lot of your New Age group have about Christ really being one or the other, not both. This is this this is this 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 falls on the uh, this fall this 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 this, this these issues of denying, of either denying his spirituality or his physicality is really what's called a heresy. It's a radical teaching. And as a matter of fact, the early church dealt with these heresies. It was a bunch of them. And that's why it's important to know church history. The early church dealt with these heresies at the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon. And they, and they codified what the church and what the Bible clearly said as to who Christ was and what he is to the church and to his people. This is what we call monophysite, monophysite, mono, meaning one, phyphysite, P-H-Y-S-T, monophysite. This is a monophysite heresy. They're saying he was, he'll be one. He can either be spiritual or he can be flesh. He can't be both of them. And so this is just one of the, and so this, this is just one of the many monophysite heresies that ravaged the church in the early days. So what John is saying to, to the people, he's commending and he's exhorting the church of the elect lady and her children for their endurance, for not falling prey to this monophysite heresy, this docetic teaching that he indeed, and it's important because the Bible teaches in John, and John says it over and over again in all his writings. I think some guy said that John says it at least 16 times in his writings that he was the begotten, the begotten. And a lot of people know what the begotten really means. The, the word begotten in Greek is the, is the, the monogenes. And the monogenes means that he, God begot Jesus in the natural, in the flesh, because he was already the eternal son. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, has always been the eternal son, but he was not always the natural son in the flesh. So when he begotten him, he's the only man in all of creation and all of the world that God begotten. And that's why we are called adopted sons and daughters of God. But he was the natural and the spiritual son of God because God wrapped him in flesh. Chili con carne. Incarnation. He wrapped him in the flesh. And he became a man. He was begotten unlike nobody else. There's nobody else that can say that they're begotten by the Holy Spirit and wrapped in flesh. We're begotten spiritually of that nature, but not of the physicality. Only Jesus was begotten in the flesh to become the God-man. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. I mean, I make this, is, this is important because this is an important doctrine that people trip over. And this is important church because there are so many people that don't accept Jesus as being begotten of a virgin and died to save lost mankind. So that's, this is important. So that's, that's, let's read. And I think the word, a black lady, I looked it up, means chosen. Mm hmm. And her children. The black lady. You said chosen. Chosen. The elect. The elect, huh? And see, and, and see this is something, and that's some that too, because I was going to later on. He doesn't use the word chosen, which is the same thing as we call it, you may also say about chosen. The elect, 
Paul, he doesn't, he, not Paul, John doesn't expound on this doctrine, but he states it, that you are the elect. The church is God's elect. The church is God's chosen. And, 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 and this is another reason why we, we need to say it. It's why they didn't fall away, because they were the elect. The elect would never fall away. Let me say that again. The elect would never fall away. It's impossible because you are the elect. Because you are heads before, let me back up, heads behind, heads behind and before. Let's read. <coughs> Let's read John right quick. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not and in whom I love in truth, and not only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us, and will be with us how long? Forever. Forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Son in truth. And love. And we'll make another one, okay? Walking in the truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some. What he say? He said, I rejoice. He said, now all this bad stuff around him, but I'm rejoicing. This church over here, this particular church, y'all are hanging in there tight. Praise be to God. Amen. Glory to God. I rejoice greatly to find some of you of your children walking in the truth. Just as we're commanded. What he say? This is commanded by the Father. And so it goes back to what Paul said to the early church in church, church of Thessalonica. Be obedient to the commands. It's important that you learn to trust and to obey. It's important that in the word to, is, to be, is to advance and to have an effect in our lives. We have to obey. We have to follow God's command. And that builds the confidence that we have in him. And, as, and, and now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but one we had from the very beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to the commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers, who say, many false teachers I hear, many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess, those who do not acquiesce, those who do not accept, those who do not pass along that Christ came in the flesh. He says that those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you do not lose what you have, hear what he said, Watch yourselves so that you do not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked ways. We'll stop right there. He said a whole heap of stuff there. Uh, what, Paul, what John is saying to, to, to the church, he, he's, he's, first of all, he commends her of them for being faithful to the teachings that did okay from Jesus Christ of the apostles. He says, let's go back to what he said. He says, whom I love in truth, and not only in truth, but also all who knew. You know, it's been said that uh, truth without love is brutality. And lo I'm going to think who said it later on. And love without truth is hypocrisy. Dr. Warren Wordsby said that. He should be, he should be years ago, he should be, he should be moody. He, I think he's still living, I think he is. He said, truth without love is brutality. And it is. You know, people say, I just tell you that I love you. If you love me, if you tell me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you that I love you. 
If you tell me the truth without demonstrating love, you're being pretty brutal to me. And I might not forgive you for real. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of people claim, you know, they claim they left the church because they were treated with love with brutality. They were given the truth in such a brutal way. They never wanted to return to hear no, no, no more truth. <laughs> so, so I'm, uh, I know that I believe that truth without love is brutality also. But he says also, love, absence of the truth, is hypocrisy. In other words, the foundation for truth, for love, comes from Eletheia, the truth itself. If you don't know the truth, how are you going to love? Because the truth of love comes from the truth giver, who is Jesus Christ. And he's saying, you can say you love and love and never get truth. You're not helping nobody. You've just been a hypocrite. So the point he popped before John said, he said, he told her, the lady, he loved her, loved them rather, <coughs> and he gave them the truth in love. He gave them both things. He gave them love and he gave them the truth. Because when it's said and done, it's the truth that informs our love. And when we love as Christ has loved, following the example, we are successful and succeed. And it says, but also know the truth because of the truth that abides in, in us. He said the truth of God abides in us. And we will and will be with us forever. When you are born of the Spirit of God, the truth of God abides in you. And he said, and it will abide in you forever. And that's why we're commanded in John's right also is to abide, is to abide, to reside, to stay, to stay, to stay, stay the course. Grace, mercy, and peace. See, he kept it all. Mercy, grace, and peace will be with us from God, the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Son, in truth and love. <coughs> so, hey, girl, he, he, he says... God abides with you in truth and love. Not just in truth, but in love as well. Because truth requires all things to be right. And love is what was doing preserve us. He said, and also in love that it chose us, because we didn't do it on our own. And he, he said that, 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 that this comes, he, he identifies both of them, that there's both the Father and the Son that this is who we have, we have been based by, by our body in the Father and the Son. Because if you remember John's writing, John talks about that a lot throughout his writing, especially in his, in his, in his gospel, about the, about the body. And, uh, those 13 through 17 chapters, the, the, he talks about that a whole lot. He says, verse 4, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children. He says, when I come down there or when I hear from you, I'm glad that you're walking in love and truth. You're demonstrating. You're experiencing it. You, you're advancing the word through your faith. You're advancing the word through your walk. The word walk there means the way of life. Perpeteo is a way of life that we need to demonstrate. Our walk should tell who we are. People should know who we are by our walk. That's really important. People should know how we... I don't mean offensive. No, I read it already. In the verse 5. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were, <clears throat> not as though as if I were writing to you a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. John was there when Jesus said, "What?" <coughs> but the new commandment he gave him. Oh, a new commandment I give unto you that you love. That you love one another. One another. Mm -hmm. He said that I'm thinking of new. He said because you know, my dear lady, you, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, and I know too because I was there. I was there with him. <clears throat> he says, and that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk, we walk again, according to his commandments. If we love the Lord, we keep his command. We obey his command. We love him. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. You've heard he said from the beginning, now you should be practicing it. You should be experiencing it in your daily living. Walking it, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. And this is where he takes on the temple right here. Basically, he's saying, if you walk in the love and the truth of God, that will establish you. Very early, Paul was talking about, he's writing about being established and guarded. The word of God, if you live and walk in it, it'll establish you and it'll guard you. 
It will protect you. It will strengthen you. And he said, <coughs> so that you may walk in it for many things are going into the world. Those who do not confess, this is the docetism, docetics, confess the coming of Jesus in the flesh. Such is one is the deceiver and the antichrist. He says, I know you're looking for people you hear about from the antichrist coming. He says, anybody that denies Christ in his true nature is an antichrist. Amen. You ain't got to be you don't know no special uh, 666 you're looking for or who that special one is. Anybody that denies the deity and the physicality of Jesus as the Savior is the antichrist. You are against him. You're against what he stands for, what he taught, what he advocates, what he, who he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to deny who God is, it is heresy. It's an abomination. <clears throat> and it said, <clears throat> watch yourselves so that you do not lose what you have worked for. He says, take note to what you have learned, mm -hmm. what you've been taught. Guard yourself. And keep it and cherish it. Bring it close to your heart and bring it into your mind that it will guide you and that it will keep you, that you won't fall away from the truth that you have. <clears throat> and you may win your full reward. In other words, you endure to the end. Everyone who does not, who, who goes on ahead, everyone who goes on ahead, who it says, who goes on ahead, he means adding to it or taking away. You know, when that goes on ahead and does not abide in Jesus Christ, does not have God. He said, if you go beyond what he, if you go beyond what's been delivered by their teachings and by who Christ was, if you add to him or take away, you don't have a no part in him. He said, Hubert says, you, he does not have God. Anyone who, does, who, who goes on ahead and does not abide, does not abide in the teachings of Christ, does not have God. <clears throat> Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. But those of us that abide in him, we have God. We have the Father and we have the Son. By abiding in the truth of who he is. <coughs> if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. He says, when they come, don't even welcome them. Don't bid them Godspeed. Don't bid them blessings of any sort, because they're not bringing a blessing to you. They're bringing a curse to you, for real. They're bringing to you the curse of death. They're bringing to you the curse of falsehood. He says, and don't even invite them into your locality. Don't even deal with them. If you know they are bringing you another Christ, other than the biblical Christ, and we know, you know, we, we like to persuade people through our eloquence and through our smartness and our erudition that we can uh, show them that, that God is real and rational. So therefore, we can convince you that you ought to believe in the real Christ. That's our style. That wasn't Paul's style. That wasn't John's style. Their desire was to proclaim the truth and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we love to persuade people because we feel like we are rational enough and they're rational enough to receive the truth. This is a spiritual thing. This is a spiritual thing. You have to have a heart for God. If you don't have a heart for God, you're not going to believe the truth of God. And this is what he's basically saying to us is that don't, don't waste your time with, with these kind of people. They're teaching the things are falsely on purpose to, to, to turn you away from the truth. Right. Fooling with them, in my day still when he's living, he said, fool, fool, you become a fool. You know, and, and there's a lot of truth in that. When you fool with the fool a long time, if you don't change him, he's going to change you. So, the point that I'm on, let me sit down, is it's important for us to remember, and, I, and I, I'm going to read one more thing, uh, have you do before we go into it's, remember, this is about this is about the first part of this was about enduring the trials and temptations in life in light of the fact that Christ will return. He has returned already, but he will return. And John said unto us, those of those of us that are enduring on the trail, endure by resisting false teachers, 
that teach that Christ is not the God of the Bible. They're teaching a different Christ. So that's, that's, that's the end with the, uh, if you got your appliances, go to Heidelberg Catechism, Day 13, Lord's Day 13. Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 13, has two parts to it. Let me turn it right Yeah, it does. It has two questions. If we were catechizing, you would have you to learn this verbatim and recite it to us. <laughs> okay? And how, Lord's Day 13 says, why? The first question is this. Why is Christ called the only begotten Son of God? Since we are also children of God. Since we are also children of God, why is Christ called the only begotten of God? Without giving me, without giving, I'll give you the answer to already. Without giving me what we read here, tell me why. This is important for us. Because you just said that he was the only one that was, nat uh, that was nat naturalized. Naturally born. Naturally born. Of a woman. Of a virgin. Woman, of a virgin woman, right. The Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. Mm -hmm. And became. And became the flesh. God. God. God, God in the flesh. In the flesh. Thank right. you. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's the, that would be my reason. He, he was the only begotten. Yeah. But we also call sons of God. So he's saying, basically, what's the distinction here? Because we're adopted into it. We are adopted. Mm -hmm. We adopted him by the works that Christ has done as our big brother, having paid the price for us. He's the only one who paid the price. And it's only him paying the price of redemption that we could ever be conceived and it's being known as adopted children, sons and daughters, son of, the, of God. Okay? So I'm going to read what it says here. Because Christ alone is the eternal and natural son of God, but we are children adopted by God by his grace. And I missed that. It's important. Right, right. By his grace. For his sake. Okay. In the second question says, Wherefore callest thou him our Lord? And it's because he hath redeemed us, both our soul and body. And I, I, I like what they did here. Because this is a lesson itself. Because there are so many people in the church that think we, that the soul is a three part is a three part entity. The, the, the humans, rather. The humans are a three part entity. We are a two part entity. We are body and soul. And this is why they specifically state these words, body and soul. Well, what's the third one people think that we are? It's spirit. It's spirit. Oh. This, the, 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 but but in, in, in Christology, in true, I say in orthodox Christology, in orthodox Christology, the spirit is part of the soul. The soul. Mm -hmm. okay. And it says, because he has redeemed us, both body and soul, from all of our sins, not with silver, gold or silver, but with his precious blood, and hath delivered us from all the power of the devil, and thus has made us his own property. And because we are property of God, that's why you can never be taken away or be lost, because you are God's property. You are not your own, and you don't belong to anybody else. You are God's property. Amen? Amen. Amen.